Hey everyone, welcome back for week number nine of Bio 20. We're officially at the halfway point because we have an 18 week semester, so yay. Preview for this week we're going to deal with sexual cell division for the first part. Second part of the week is going to deal with basis or the basics of inheritance. Next week, we'll worry about actual inheritance and inheritance problems. So, you know, I guess trigger warning, there's going to be some math involved for next week. There'll be some this week too, but more next week. The worksheet for this week is going to be comparing mitosis with meiosis. So, you know, in lab, we're going to deal with mitosis. We're going to be using microscopes again, and you're also going to be using some little manipulatives. We also need to pool class data, so it's very much going to be a game of can you count and count numbers and things like that. We have, obviously, a quiz and a lab. This lab is going to be individual in terms of your analysis, so it's going to be a little bit different. You've had a few weeks of pairs and individuals. This week and next week are going to be individual labs, though. Part number one and topic number one is going to be sexual life cycles. So you should be able to provide reasons as to why sexual reproduction is necessary. Listen, describe sexual reproduction increases genetic diversity. Describe and draw life cycles for plants, fungi, and animals, and say when they're haploid or diploid. So one of the things that we know is true about existence is change is constantly happening. So the environment is constantly changing. We know viruses are always changing. We know bacteria are always changing. The food that we consume is constantly changing. Everything is always changing on us. And one of the things that people have asked about is, well, why does why do we have so much change? There are several ways that we can combat this change or we can attempt to explain this change. And this isn't necessarily the answer. This is one of the answers because it's probably too complex of a question to reduce to a single line. But there's something referred to as the Red Queen Hypothesis, which I first read about in this particular book. It's written by, his name is Matt Ridley. So he's a science author, but he's not a scientist, which means his work is quasi-accessible. It helps if you understand science. It makes reading the books easier. But it, it's... You can get it. So what he puts forth in this book is what's referred to as the Red Queen Hypothesis. And the Red Queen Hypothesis is actually a reference to Alice in Wonderland. I think my copy of Alice in Wonderland is at another campus. Anyway, so the basic postulate part from this portion of Alice in Wonderland, this is the second book, is Alice meets the Red Queen, and the Red Queen asks, hey, do you want to become a queen? And Alice says, yeah, of course. And she said, well, you have to play across the chessboard. So she grabbed her by the hand, and they started to run, and they were running and running and running, but they stayed in the same spot. So they were basically running in place, except, you know, they felt the wind blowing and all that other fun stuff and out of breath, but that they didn't go anywhere. This is what in evolution speak and genetic speak and biology speak is referred to as an arms race. And one such thing where we have an arms race is with a parasite. So worms or other, so some type of crustacean or viruses or bacteria, what have you. The result is you need to constantly change so that you stay in the same spot because the virus or the bacterium or whatever it is is going to try and get into your body to cause harm because that's how they work. They, Us being harmed equals they benefit, so they need to get into us so that they survive. We have an imperative to not. So we evolve mechanisms generation to generation to try and avoid them. And they then get locked out, so they then get the imperative 
to go through evolution so that some of their offspring can break into us. And the result is we run away, they catch up. We run away, they catch up. We run away, they catch up. So we're running, but we're staying in the same spot, which is we're still getting infected. And that's what we mean by the arms race, or we're changing to not change at all. This can be explained via sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction gives us the opportunity to fight back. The way it does this is our proteins and enzymes need to be something a little bit different because clearly if they broke in to our cells, they had the right keys to get in. So we need our genetic information that tells how to make these proteins and these enzymes to change too. The best way to do this is we need to come up with a different combination of these proteins and enzymes that will stop them from coming on in. So how can we do this? We do this by changing our genetic information. If we change our genetic information, we might change those proteins. That might be enough to block them out. Or we can make different combinations of all of our proteins. And that might be enough to block the parasites and not let them in. This also gives us the opportunity to cover up some nasty alleles or these nasty traits that some of us have. If they turn out to be genetic, we can get other individuals' information to kind of suppress those less than desirable outcomes or phenotypes or traits that we have. So there's a need for some type of sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction allows for all of that, where we can get these new combinations. That's something that does not exist with normal asexual reproduction. Going through the cell cycle and going through mitosis does not provide new combinations. But sexual reproduction does. That will manifest in what we call life, life cycles. And... Of all the groups of organisms on Earth, fungi, plants, and animals have the most clearly defined life cycles. So those are the ones that we're going to look at. When we look at these organisms, we can define them based upon how many chromosomes they have, whatever a chromosome is, so some type of structure that they have. We would call them a diploid cell or a diploid organism if they have two complete sets of chromosomes. Meaning, if I look at this figure here where I have a short, a medium, and a long chromosome, if I have two shorts, two mediums, and two longs, I have two complete sets, and I would call myself diploid. If, on the other hand, I only had one set, one short, one medium, one long, I would call myself haploid. But what if you have six total, six total chromosomes, but they're not two, two, and two. Like you have one, three, and two, or something like that. That's a different story, and we'll deal with that one in a bit. So if I look at these combinations of, hiplo of haploids and diploids, if I look at animals, animals spend most of their time being diploid. So I am diploid, you are diploid, your dog is diploid, your cat is diploid. The mites that are living on our foreheads, they are diploid. The spider in the corner of your room is diploid. The birds chirping outside, those are diploid. So for the most part, animals spend their lives as being diploid. We can find some exceptions with some ant or with some of the insects, but let's ignore those. Most of the life is spent diploid. There's only a short portion of animals' lives that are spent as being haploid, and that is... Whenever you make a sperm or the egg, sperms and eggs are haploid. Everything else turns out to be diploid amongst the animals for the most part. We can find exceptions to this, though. If I look at fungi, 
so molds and yeasts and stuff like that, they spend most of their time as being haploid. They only become diploid when they need to reproduce and then produce a fruiting body to go back to being haploid. So most of their time is spent as being haploid. When they mate, that's when they become diploid. What they'll do is make a fruiting body. And the point of that fruiting body is to make spores that can then get released and they continue again where those spores are haploid. Plants alternate between being diploid and haploid, and we call that the alternation of generations. So plants make full-blown structures that turn out to be haploid and full-blown structures that turn out to be diploid. Depending on the type of plant you're looking at will determine how much is haploid and how much is diploid. So there is some variation. If you're looking at a flowering plant, most of what you're looking at is diploid. You have to look at the flower and the pollen to find the haploids. But if you're looking at something like moss, I mean, we've had all this rain in California. If you look on the ground in shady areas, you probably have moss. We have a whole bunch of moss growing in our front yard. That there is going to be mostly diploid, or excuse me, mostly haploid, and some of it will turn out to be diploid. So we're kind of all over the place with plants. The way that we go from being diploid to haploid is a process called meiosis, and that's where we're going next.